And it's a pleasure to be here in Maryland, where I graduated many years ago, uh, 1992, and my advisor, Professor Miller, is in the audience too, so that's a uh, double pleasure. So I'll uh, talk about our experience in building a hybrid uh, 3G Wi-Fi network uh, for open access research testbed for next generation wireless networks called Orbit Project. <coughs> so I have, uh, I'm just a spokesperson, so there are a lot of people who have done hard work, John Lane, Sampat Rangarajan, Lili, and Suli. So here's the outline of the presentation. I'll talk about the orbit test bed, then the field trial network. I'll talk about architecture, the components. Then I'll talk about the handoff in 3G network. I'll talk about the handoff in 8211 network. I'll talk about the handoff between the two. Then I'll talk about multicast in this hybrid network and uh, the conclusion. So Orbit is, uh, as I said, is an open access research test bed for next generation wireless networks. So this is a NSF funded project, 5.4 million for three and a half years. Uh, this is a collaboration between industry, which is Lucent, uh, my department, IBM, uh, Thomson, and Academia, Rutgers Wind Lab, Princeton, and Columbia. So <coughs> the two components of the Orbit project, one is the test bed, which is uh, the real network, and uh, and the second component is various experiments, like multimedia experiments, security experiments that others want to do on this internet. <coughs> and the test bed has two components. One is the lab emulation network, and the other is the field trial network. So it looks like this. Uh, this is the uh, orbit test bed. This is the lab emulation network, which is a grid of 32 by 32 radio nodes, which have multiple radio interfaces. And you can set up a network here using these nodes, people could remotely access the testbed from anywhere, very much in the lines of any lab or talent lab uh, kind of context. And the other component of the uh, testbed is the outdoor network, which is a 3G uh, network and a Wi-Fi interpreter network. So I'll focus on this part, which is the field transfer. So this is a map of the Rutgers University. In fact, uh, this is Rutgers University, those who are not familiar, it's a very disjoint campus. They have like a Bush campus here, Livingston campus here, College Avenue campus here, New Brunswick campus here. So they're very really disparate locations and they're connected by a bus route. And you see that dotted line that shows the bus route and so students take the buses. And what we want to do, uh, this bus route is about, you know, five miles in uh, uh, total, uh, I think about uh, two mile radius or something like that. And it's about five miles total area that we need to uh, cover. And what we're doing is, along this, this half of the bus route will be covered by the 3G, and half of the bus route will be outside the range of 3G. So what will happen is, along this route, we have this uh, 802.11 access points or radio routers. So we'll have a combined 3G 802.11. So if you are in the bus, for example, and you are traveling in this part of the route, and there's nothing 3G about it, you have to connect to this uh, Wi-Fi points. And once you are inside the 3G area, then probably you go through either 3G, or Wi-Fi, depending on the uh, connectivity. And we want to build this network and uh, and make it open to people so that they can run experiments. So let's uh, talk about the architecture uh, of the network. And architecture is at a high level; it's very simple. That is, uh, 
you know, when the uh, 802.11 network is not available, go through the switching, and uh, when you have uh, 802.11 available, go through 802.11. And in fact, you look at something hybrid in, in situations like, for example, you go through the 3G network, send a request, but the response comes back from 82.11. There are situations where you need that. For example, you want to download a huge video file, and you don't have bandwidth on the 3G. So you could send the request to the 3G, but you get the download through 82.11. And it did not happen in instantaneously, it could happen asynchronously. So that's another possibility. Now, in the architecture, let's take a level deeper into the architecture. In the architecture, we have what is called BSR, base station router. I'll talk about that later. So this is like a, you know, 3G network in a box. So I'll show you those who know uh, 3G cellular network. It's pretty complex. And, uh, if you want to deploy 3G networks, it really needs a lot of domain expertise. But this idea is to take the 3G network, collapse it into a box, which is called a base station router. We shall have a radio interface on one side and IP interface on the other side. Pretty much like an access point. Can you have a 3G access point, if you want to call it that way? But I'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, then we have the mobile wireless gateway, which is a device which should be mounted on a bus. So this will have dual interface. One will connect to the 3G, one interface, the other interface will go to the 8 level. So people in the bus will have in a PTS or laptop with Wi-Fi, and they'll connect to the mobile wireless gateway, and this will connect either to the 3G or to the 2 level network. So that's the MWG. And RP or rendezvous point is nothing but an access point with our software. We call it rendezvous point because I'll show you that they do additional stuff, uh, which is a traditional access point does not do. And then we have what is called access gateway. So this is the gateway to the internet. Whether you come to a 3G or 11, you have to, this is a choke point or convergence point from which you go to the internet. So this is the high-level architecture, and you know I show that as the you move uh, from the 3G to the 11, so you have a handoff here between the 3G and 11, and also you could uh, move uh, in the 11 network just between the uh, rendezvous point. You have a handoff at that point. Now, take, let's let me you know since this is an implementation thing, I'll give you you know very some of the very pragmatic things. So the, how does the implementation? How does it really work? Okay, the way this works is for the uh, 3G access, what we do is, the mobile has a private IP address, like 192, 168, 1, uh, 200, and MWG has a private interface on one side and a public interface on the other side. The public IP address to the MWG is allocated by the 3G network, like 68, 85, 1, 100, allocated by the 3G network. So the packets go from here to there, and the MWG will turn on the packet to the access gateway, and it goes up to the internet. And exactly the similar kind of thing happens in the when you go to the uh, Wi-Fi network. Again, you go through this public uh, uh, private interface, and this MWG gets the public address now from the access gateway. So packets go here, you turn on the packet to access gateway and go up to the internet and back and forth. So this is now let me say a few words about the you know 3G network architecture and you know, I try to motivate the use of VSR and what kind of issues that we see with that. Now, 3G network looks like this. You have what is called a base station, or the BTS, base station transceiver. These are the towers that you see on the, you know, highways. And these uh, BTSs, you use a T1 line to, you know, haul it back into what is called BSC, a base station controller. So there are about, let's say, an order of hundreds of these BTSs go into one base station controller. And you know, 50 of these BSs go into PDSN. So it's like one PDSN serving about 5,000 base stations, just to give you an idea. Like in New York, New Jersey area, there are only two PDSNs which cover the entire New York, New Jersey area. So that's just to give you a feel as to how much area is covered by one PDSN. Okay? And here, the PPP connection, the link there connection is established between the mobile uh, MWG and the PDSN. Okay? Now, what we are doing is, we are saying that this is too complicated, and we want to replace that with a 3G in a box. And we collapse everything into this BSR, and this is a prototype that we built in the labs. So you have the uh, radio interface here and IP interface on that side. And since you collapse everything, this becomes your first point of IP in the network. Previously in the 3G network, the first point that you see IP is PDSN, which is deep inside the network. But with a base station router, IP is moved farther out, close to the base station. So this is the BSR architecture. And so now PTP connection is between the MWG and the BSR. So I, 
And so basically, if, uh, uh, as I said, with this simplifies the uh, uh, whole architecture. And the components in the BSR, uh, I talked about all the good things about BSR. And it seems very simple. Now, let's talk about what are the problems with it. Nothing comes for free. Okay. Now, one of the problems with BSR is frame selection for soft handoff becomes very difficult because there's no hierarchy. Now, what happens in CDMA networks is the the mobile transfers to multiple base stations, and base stations this forward the frames to what is called the base station controller. As I said, the multiple base stations go to one base station controller, and controller decides which of the frames to choose. So that's for frame selection. Now imagine what happens. There's no hierarchy now. There's no base station controller. Everything is collapsed into one box. Now the mobile is transmitting it to two to, to BSRs. Who does the frame selection? Now you have to have some kind of communication between the BSRs. And that means you haul it through a T1 line into the network and bring it back. It becomes complicated unless some metro Ethernet kind of architecture comes up. So it's not immediately clear how you do some kind of frame selection. The other thing that happens is handoff becomes a real issue. As I was telling you in the Verizon's network in the New York, New Jersey area, there's one or two big PDSLs which cover the entire New York, New Jersey area. So a person like me normally doesn't leave that area, so I don't even see any kind of handoff. But now, you know, once you push IP all the way to the base stations, then instead of one, you have 5,000 IP inputs. So as you, you know, move, it becomes, you know, have to have handoff. So handoff becomes a real issue. And unless you can solve this handoff problem, there are things which you cannot do. Examples being voice over IP. Suppose I want to do voice over IP from my handset. Today we cannot. We use a circuit switch connection. Final leg to my handset is circuit. Now once I go packet, and if I cannot solve this, you know, handoff problem, so in other words, I'm saying that when I move from one BSR to another BSR, and if to establish a connection with the other BSR it takes me, you know, a few seconds, why so IP packets come every 20 milliseconds? So one second means I lose 50 packets. Two seconds means I lose 100 packets. And think of the quality. Do you think people will use it? No. So you have to solve this problem. It's a real problem if you want to support, you know, things like voice over IP. And the other problem with BSR is it needs a greenfield deployment. That means that, you know, if you go to Verizon's network, which already has a 3G deployment, try to push this, it's not clear how this will mesh into the existing infrastructure. But if a new service provider comes up, it's great. I say, hey, you deploy these boxes and you don't need a legacy grid. So those kind of things you have to think about if you try to deploy it in the real network. Now, other components are, as I said, MWG, uh, mobile wireless gateway. So this is a box sitting in the bus. So what this does is basically this uh, takes a packet from here, sends it through the 3G, or sends it through the uh, Wi-Fi network. The other thing this guy does is once it moves into Wi-Fi, it notifies the mobile that, hey, high-speed connection is available. So if the mobile requests a video download, which it could not do in the 3G, now is the time that it can download to the Wi-Fi network. So those kind of things are facilitated by MWG. And RP is uh, the rendezvous points. I'll show you that they play a role in terms of handoff, when you want to go from one RP to another RP access point, you know, there is a, it's an issue, and I'll show you that, how they play a role to do the handoff. And the other thing is the access gateway, as I said, without going into very much details, I'm saying that from the 3G, you convert into here, from Wi-Fi, convert into here, so this is really the gateway to the internet, and we have a lot of leeway with that, and uh, I don't want to spend much time on that. Now, first, let me talk about the handoff in the 3G world. And then I'll talk about the handoff in Wi-Fi. Let's look at the handoff issues. So when the mobile is here, MWG is here, it's connected to this BSR. And the PTP connection is between the MWG and the BSR. Okay? Now, the packets are coming in, internet, through the BSR, over the PTP connection, to the handset. Now, when the mobile moves from here to the target cell, to the new BSR, what are the choices you have? You have to establish a PPP connection. So you have three choices. One choice is, well, you know, let's forget about this connection. Let's establish a new connection with this BSR. So the implication of that is all the packets which are in flight will be dropped. Okay. The second thing you can say, well, let's not clear the PPP connection. Let it be between the MWG and the old BSR, even though I'm in the new BSR, but I'll tunnel the package to the old BSR. So that's the second option. You'll anchor the PPP at the old BSR. And the third option says, well, you know, maybe, but if you do that, for every handoff, you'll involve two BSRs. 
The other option says that, well, let's connect to this new BSR and migrate the PPP state from here to there. And once I migrated the state, then let's forget about this and let's carry on. So we actually implemented the third option. You migrate the PPP from the old to the new BSR. And I'll show you, you know, what kind of performance implications it has. So, so this is a step-by-step -step view of what happens in our PPP state migration. So when the mobile moves from the serving cell to the target cell, it establishes a connection with the BSR, new BSR, the previous connection goes away. Okay, now in the meantime, all the packets that are coming here, all the packets that were in transit, the old BSR will tunnel the packet to the uh, new BSR, and in fact, the PPP connection remains between the MWG and the old BSR. Packets will be now tunneled, you know, through the old BSR, to the new BSR, over the PPP connection, to the MWG, to the mobile. But why this is happening in our case, it's a transient, transient phase. We don't keep, the, keep one possibility, as I said, second option, you keep on doing it forever. You go to the next one, you go test up this new tunnel. In our case, we said this is wasteful. We'll do it only for the transient period, and then we do the following thing. We migrate the PPP state, and once I migrate the PPP state, I establish a new connection from here to here, I get rid of the old connections completely. And once I have the new connection, I migrated the, in the entire PPP state, then I can have the packets going this way, over the new PPP to the mobile. And the details of, you know, again, you know, these things are sim simple, but to implement you know, it's, uh, some of the, the non trivial issues, blah, blah. And we have to come up with some signaling mechanism. Again, when you have to do that, you have to come up with mechanism which is standard. You know, you cannot just come up with something which is just random. So we have to be within the framework of the signaling and come up with the mechanism to do the PPP state migration. And this is what we did. Basically, here I show that this is a mobile station and this uh, new BSR. It's the old BSR and this is the internet, a home agent for mobile IP, those who are familiar. So, so what happens is when the mobile moves to a new BSR, the new BSR holds the PPP frame to the mobile and sends the PPP migration request to the new, to the old BSR. Old BSR holds the IP packet coming from this side and sends the migration response and also sends the PPP state related parameters. So I'm migrating state. All the state of PPP connection will be sent to the new BSR. And then you do migration confirm uh, while sending the packets. You recreate and activate the PPP state at the new BSR, process the PPP frames which, are, uh, which were on hold and also those coming from the mobile session and send the packet to the old BSR uh, through the tunnel. And you do the same thing in the other direction, packets coming in from the internet, you send the packets uh, to the you know, new BSR, tunnel over the, uh, the tunnel, and you do PPP migration acknowledgement. And after that, what happens is, this guy becomes the new foreign agent for mobile IP. So it will do mobile IP agent advertisement, mobile IP registration request, goes to home agent, registration reply comes back. And then after that, the old BSR is completely out of the picture. Packets coming in to the new BSR, the tunnels to the internet, to the home agent. And then you release the, uh, the tunnel. PP releases the, the white bidirectional tunnel that I showed you earlier, that you release that. Okay, now, when we first proposed this, the people within Lucent said, well, you know, this does not seem like a feasible idea. Because how can I migrate PPP state? It's a lot of information, and we cannot do it. But fine, let's see how much information is there. So look at PPP, look at the basically dissected PPP. So, well, PPP has uh, LCP, link control protocol, PAP, password authentication protocol, chat, challenge access protocol, compression control protocol, IPCP, header compression. And look at how much state is there. The state we found is about 300 bytes. So it's not much, contrary to what people think. It's a huge amount of state, not really. Small amount of state. And now, then we said, well, uh, People say we cannot do it, let's implement it. So we implemented the PPP state migration in the Linux. And then we did some measurements. Because at the end of the day, we had to measure and show that what we're proposing makes sense. So what we compare is two things. We compare the first option, that is to break the connection and establish a new connection, which is called PPP reinitiation. And we see that, you know, how much time it takes to establish that. And the second one we compared is, let's say PPP state migration without, you know, breaking the previous connection. So what we found is, in case of uh, reinitiation, you see the delay is in our 2,000 milliseconds to about 9,000 milliseconds. That is 2 to about 9 seconds. So if we take an average of 5 seconds, so if 20 millisecond packets, I lose 250 packets when I do handle, which is terrible in terms of quality. 
But if I do, you know, PPP state migration, and with IPCP negotiation, it takes roughly about 250 milliseconds, which is about 12 packets. So again, still, this is not the ideal situation, but still, it's the best we could do. And again, in many situations, if you use mobile IP, you don't need that green part, which is the IPCP negotiation. Then it's just this gray part, which is 50 milliseconds. I lose about two packets. So I can show that by doing this PPP state migration, I can significantly improve the quality of the voice over IP. Example, uh, in case of uh, 3 g cellular. How much more am I actually doing here over mobile IP? Oh, mobile IP uh, will, will not be able to deal with this, because mobile IP... I know that, but how much more are you doing? Actually? How much more... Uh, how much more are you doing when you do the PPP state, PPP state migration? Yeah. Than what you need for mobile IP? In mobile IP, you could do even... Mobile IP is independent of whether you do this or you do this. Right. So I could do mobile IP with this, or I could do mobile IP with that. Right. So if I do mobile IP with this, then the performance is really bad. But if mobile IP, I do it with our scheme underneath, okay. then I get better performance. I'm still using mobile IP in both cases. But if I use mobile IP, then the green part is not there. I just have this part, which is 15 milliseconds, which will significantly improve the performance of mobile IP. So, what's the reason uh, of this uh, performance scheme? It is meaning because the bandwidth between uh, 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 BSR is more is higher than uh, the bandwidth between the mobile and the uh, station. I mean, what the reason? What would be the reason, main reason for this improvement? Okay. Uh, for, uh, performance improvement. Perform the main reason is like uh, yeah, one of the reasons is the the air link bandwidth is limited, right? Mm -hmm. So if you establish a new PPP connection, you have to do a lot of signaling over there. You have to do like the NCP, then you know IPCP and CCP and all these things back and forth. Each one of them takes a quite a bit of round trip time. So if I do PPP state migration, I'm avoiding all those controls. Okay, so, yeah. They are all, all, almost cut out. As a result, I can save that time. Okay, so That's the main intuition. Now let's look at the handoff in the uh, Wi-Fi network. Again, you know, uh, this is an area which is, people have done a lot of work. Then when we tried to build this, we said, well, you know, can we take something which is existing and try to put in the network? Now, this is the problem that we faced that uh, did not really serve our purpose. We want a very fast handoff between the uh, RPs, on new points, uh, in the 82 level network, and this is a challenge. And we need a uh, very fast handoff again for the same reason, that is for, if I want to support voice over IP, I don't want to lose many packets. So the way this works here, <coughs> I'll give you the scheme, and here the thing that you should look for is the mobile IP, uh, the uh, end device has a fixed IP address, which is 10, 1, 1, 100, and a default router, 10, 10, 0, 1. The key idea here is, for each IP endpoint, when you want to send out packets, you have to have default router. Now, what we did is we said, well, default router IP address is 10, 10, 0, 1. This is a virtual IP address. Virtual IP address means that all the rendezvous points, they'll be using the same IP address. And, and I'll show you the benefit of that. As a result, this end system does not have to change. One of our design criteria here is people should be able to access the internet without any change in their machine, without downloading any software. They should be able to take their, any laptop and should be able to get you know, seamless mobility. Most of the cases, what you, have, what you have to do is you have to download some patch into the operating system. For the Windows, does not support. Microsoft today does not support mobile IP. So if I have to do you know, these kind of things, I have to download some extra software on my laptop. So our design criteria is, we don't want to touch the handset. It should be whatever the stock laptop people have, they should use that and still be able to get the seamless mobility. And that puts you know, some additional constraints, and as a result, we have to do something different. Now, here, in the, uh, I'll show you some of the you know, key ideas here. For example, here, if you look at the mobile, mobile maintains what is called R cache. And our cache has the, this is the IP address of the default router. And uh, the default router in this case is RP1. You're going through this default router. And the physical address for this, uh, corresponding to this IP address, is the physical address of RP1. That's the, you need that for packets going out of the mobile, they should be sent to this RP1. So as a result, this is the information which should be used to, you know, forward the packets. In the reverse direction, when the packets are coming back from the internet to the mobile, you need a location table that access gateway. And the location table basically keeps track of where the mobile is. It basically says that for this mobile, this is IP address and this is the uh, physical address of the mobile. 
And if we have to send any packet to the mobile, it should be routed through 192.168.41, which happens to be RP1. So this guy keeps track of where the mobile is and which RP is supporting the mobile. Now if you move, and so the packets coming in are transported like this. Now, what happens when you move? When you move, what you want is the moment the mobile is here, I want the uh, packets from the mobile to go through the internet and packets coming from the internet to immediately go to the mobile. So if this establishment takes a long time, then I lose. And I have to do that very quickly. So what we do is something like this. The moment the mobile moves, this RP2 will send what is called gratuitous R, which basically is change this binding. This is in the this is the art cache of the mobile when the mobile was here. It says that the default router is 10, 10, 0, 1, and the physical address is this, which happens to be physical address of RP1. So this is the state before you move. Before you move, this is what it looks like at the mobile. Your mobile should forward the packets to RP1. When the mobile moves, the moment this goes on, RP2 sends a gratuitous R, and what the gratuitous R does is the following. It changes the binding. It this address remains the same, which is the virtual address of this. But the physical address binding changes. As a result, all packets going up to the mobile will be now routed to RP2 as opposed to RP1. So this seems straightforward, but this is actually a pretty uh, nice observation because here, most of the people, they do IP layer 3. And layer 3, you know, layer 3, anything that you want to do at IP level takes an order of you know, hundreds of milliseconds. That seems a short amount of time, but not when you do voice over IP. You have to do it in milliseconds. And that's when you say, well, the moment this guy knows layer translation, immediately it changes the R cache. And this takes about, you know, less than a second, less than a millisecond. So any packet going out to the mobile immediately will be routed to RP2 as opposed to RP1. So how does it, how does it realize that? Well, that is, when, when the mobile moves into this uh, RP2, at the layer 2 there's a registration. Right. Uh, it provides the, uh, the uh, physical address of the mobile is provided to this uh, access point. So the, the round trip from the mobile to the intermediate point all the way up to the other, to force the gratuitous arc takes on the order of milliseconds? No, no. no that's not. The, what it's saying is when the mobile moves into this RP, right. then there's a layer to registration that is sends the uh, ad, uh, hardware address. So who initiates that? The mobile? Yeah, mobile is, is negotiated between the mobile and the RP. Right, so that means he's sending out a message every. It's, it sends out the, it uh, latches on, realizes there's a signal, and sends out uh, layer to registration. Right. And right after it sends out layer to registration, I'm saying that once this layer to registration is done, from that point on, just to send the gratuitous R, it's less than millisecond. It happens instantaneously. But of course, uh, to your point, there is a the sign which is still, I mean, the sending of uh, the layer to registration takes about you know, three or four milliseconds. And so this, with this, this direction packets are fixed. Now packets will go to this RP. But what happens to the other side? You also, when the packets come in to access gateway, you have to change the location table at the access gateway at the same time. So, and how do you prevent other, other um, uh, machines from listening to the mobile broadcasting its own layer 2 registration? You don't. Okay. You don't. So in our case, you know, we've, uh, others could listen. But uh, the registration will happen with the uh, access point that it latches onto. So just as uh, you update it, you also have to update the location table. So this is the location table, you know, before the mobile moved here. You remember that when the packets come in, access gateway knows to reach this mobile, which is this one, it has to go through RP1, which is this address. But once the mobile moves here, the RP does two things. It sends the gratuitous are down and location update up. So location of the lab goes up like that. And uh, this is another key thing. Looks very simple, but this is one of the key things that we found is interesting. When RP is sending out the update, it's using the mobile's physical address. So you don't see that before. Because why is it using physical address? The reason it's using physical address is it knows only the physical address. It does not know the IP address. So it sends the physical address, and that is used as a key to look up the routing table and the uh, location table. And immediately you update the uh, update the uh, the location of the mobile. That is, the access gateway now knows that. So access gateway knows if a packet comes in, 
for the destiny for this mobile, it should send it through this 192.168.5.1, which happens in this RB2, and the package will be forwarded like this. Now, so what is new about it? Okay, now, the new thing that we believe are the following. The, I think that for the first time we said that that we need a fill the we use the concept of a default uh, router IP address, which is a virtual IP address. And only thing the physical uh, the physical binding changes, and as a result we can do things very quickly. The second thing is the access gateway uh, keeps the location information in the location table, and uh, so once the layer two handoff is completed, RP sends a get to SR immediately after the layer two handoff and sends a location update immediately after the layer two handoff. And as a result of this, we are able to do layer three handoff, which is in the order of some millisecond because there's a one-way delay from the between the two messages we are sent, what is the minimum time that you take. And we did some calculation measurements again. So what we found is uh, if we if you take a stock access point and try to see you know, how much it takes for uh, layer two handoff, layer two handoff can be as high as five hundred milliseconds. So and the main reason that layer two handoff takes that time is two reasons. First of all, the mobile it does not start looking for a new access point until its signal send really, really drops. So as a result, you know, it should have started a long time ago, but it waits until the signal drops and then it starts probing. And that takes a long time. And uh, what we said is, you know, let's try to cut down on the threshold and uh, let's see what happens. And we did some manual association of the uh, access point and the mobile. And what we found is that that blue thing, which is the left <coughs> hand of delay, that dropped significantly to like about four or five milliseconds. So it dropped from 500 milliseconds to four or five milliseconds. And then you have the uh, update, R crash update, which is about one or two uh, millisecond, one millisecond here. And then the yellow one is the ping latency that goes to the network and comes back. And overall, we're able to uh, cut down on the latency significantly. And the other thing we noticed, the packet loss. If you do uh, mobility, micro mobility experiment in 8.11 network, you'll see that huge number of packets are lost. We found that about 45, if you send a ping in the network and expect reply back, we lost about 45 packets. That means if I do voice over IP, I lose that many packets, and my quality is going to suffer. But what happens with our scheme is we are able to cut down that you know, ping reply packet loss, or in general, the packet loss count was significantly reduced, close to zero. So as a result, we improved the performance. So here is the you know, uh, various mobility protocols. A lot of uh, things have been proposed in literature. And uh, we tried to use, find one which matches our needs, but we couldn't find one which matches our needs. In fact, in, uh, I don't want to spend much time, but the only thing I want to say, if you focus on red ones, red entries, which says that if you do not anticipate layer two handoff, then your delay is going to be much longer, 250 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, round trip delay, a bit of peer to peer, it's going to be high. And only if you anticipate layer 2 handoff, which is a blue entry, then you can go down to milliseconds. So in our case, we did not anticipate layer 2 handoff, but we were able to bring it down significantly lower. So handoff between the 3G cellular and uh, 8211, actually this comes out, uh, how much time do I So this handoff actually uh, comes out for free for us because the, what happens in our case is the TCP is session between the uh, handset here or the laptop here and the TCP endpoint somewhere in the internet. And the intermediate point, MWG is the one who is moving, whose IP address is changing. When it's 3G, its IP address is something. When it moves to Wi-Fi, its IP address is changing. But so when mobile is concerned, its IP address and the endpoint IP address does not change. So MWG in fact hides the transport level mobility. So it comes for free in some sense. And uh, in fact, uh, when the mobile moves, you know, the IP address of the uh, MWG changes, but the TCP endpoint remains the same. As a result, uh, we get the single standard. What are the extensions to architecture? Okay. We assume so far that we have a 3G and Wi-Fi network, and they uh, are kind of overlapping. So I either get 3G or Wi-Fi, but we never assume that we, there are situations with dead zones, neither 3G or 2 So we said, can we extend that? And then we want to extend it using uh, ad hoc network. So in the ad hoc network, we throw in some ad hoc relay nodes. So for example, if the mobile wants to access, let's say, a Wi-Fi network, it goes through one of the relays, 
and the relay will forward the packet to this uh, MWG, which is RP proxy, takes it to RP network. So basically, I connect to the relay, relay will forward the packet to a proxy, which is, which is connecting me to the Wi-Fi. And similarly, for the 3G, it can happen the same way. The mobile goes to this access point, with, uh, the relay node, which takes it to this uh, 3G proxy, which takes it to 3G network. By so relay nodes, do you mean the nodes are fixed, or are they like can be they themselves can be users? They themselves could be users. Yeah. So that's why it's, uh, it's ad hoc as opposed to the fixed infrastructure. So especially in the Rikers campus, I don't know if you noticed, there's a river. So uh, the director of Willab said, "Hey, you have this very nice architecture, but what if you know it cannot go across the river? And can we leverage some of the you know other mobile nodes, maybe other people in other buses to do some of the routing?" I said, "Fine, we'll try that." So that's what we have the extensions. We have got. Uh, so that's the extension we're talking about. Now, I want to spend the next 15-20 you know, minutes on the multicast in the uh, hybrid network. And I'll talk about two algorithms that we came up with. One is the greedy heuristics, other is the near optimal algorithm to compute this multicast problem. Let me first try to motivate. Why do we need multicast? Is it because uh, multicast sounds cool or there's some need for it? Well, the multicast has become very popular in the 3G network. For example, uh, the carriers like Verizon and Singular, they want to you know, broadcast, uh, uh, they want to multicast information to the users. For example, in Korea, uh, there are already like TV stations are being broadcast over the wireless channels, for example. So there are uh, companies in India, Reliance, they are saying that we want to distribute like uh, cricket matches or something like in a baseball match over the, you know, two people's handset. So there are multicast, the need for multicast is popping up. But if we want to do 3G multicast, what happens is the throughput of the 3G multicast is limited by the worst case receiver. Some receivers are nearby, I can transmit a high rate. Some receivers are far out at the edge. For they, I cannot transmit a high rate. So the total rate is limited by the worst case receiver. And I don't want that to happen in 3G network. And you cannot do the rate control? No, you can, you can do rate control, but again, that will be at the cost of something else. So, for example, if you want to satisfy somebody else, then you penalize somebody else. So, we want to, don't take that approach and try to see if there's another way that you could provide high throughput to the end user. So, we are saying, well, one of the approaches could be, you know, instead of multicasting to everybody, if I multicast to the, one of the receivers at the best possible in the channel rate, and then that guy used ad hoc relay to distribute packets to the end system. Do you get yeah. feedback for the rate? Uh, How do you know the rate? We well, get a feedback. In CDMS, from, from the rate. In the CDMS system, there's something called DRC, which is the data rate uh, control packet, which goes back from mobiles to the network in 600 times a second. Okay. So you get huge constant feedback, and based on that, you know at what rate in the people receive it. So get that feedback. So based on that, we're saying, well, let's use the best possible 3G downlink to send the packet to a node in the ad hoc network and leverage the high bandwidth of the ad hoc network to reach the multicast group members. So send it to the high bandwidth relay and let that distribute the ad hoc network, use it, the ad hoc network to distribute it. In that case, it sounds appealing, but it's not as simple. You say, well, the Wi-Fi network has huge capacity. So if I can send it and if I can do a tree in Wi-Fi, problem is uh, solved. But it's not really, because Wi-Fi network, there's a lot of interference. If you don't take into account interference, then it's a good idea. But if you take interference into account, I can show you that sometimes the Wi-Fi network itself can become the bottleneck. So we have to explicitly consider interference in that network. This assumes that the ad hoc network bandwidth is high. Yes, the ad hoc... Otherwise, you would get a bottleneck. Correct. The ad hoc network, we assume, is 11 megabit per second. As of 3G is, you know, less than... Uh, about a megabit for uh, a video. So this is architecture. Architecture is this is the uh, wireless network is here. This is the uh, internet PDSL packet in the RNC internet of controller and HDR. I use the term HDR for those who are you know uh, into the uh, cellular world. HDR stands for high data rate 3G network, mm -hmm. and it's also called 1x video. So I'll use this term you know DO, uh, HDR, and 3G synonymously. But, you know, for a period of time, they are not the same, but for the sake of this discussion, I'll use them some others. So he, this is the HDR downlink. You send it to this proxy client. Proxy client will send it to relay client. Relay client sends it to destination client. So you do unicast up to this proxy, and then you multicast using the Wi-Fi. How would you decide on the proxy? The that's, the, that's the algorithm. Yeah. I'll talk about that. 
So let me give you some more motivation as to why we want to do that. Now, in the ACR downlink channel, that rate reduces with the distance. So this is the, uh, the average uh, channel rate, which actually drops significantly as the distance from the base station increases. So as the cell radius becomes from 0 to like 1 mile, the peak throughput from 2.4 megabit per second drops to about 200 kilobit per second. Significant drop. And the, you know, the fluctuation that you see on the uh, blue dot, this is the instantaneous rate, and this is the average rate. Also, if you look at multicast, it's even worse, because multicast throughput reduces as the number of mobiles uh, increase. First of all, if you use multicast with like five receivers, the throughput drops to over 80 kilobit per second. Why? Because, the, it, as, as I said, there's some receiver which is the far out from the cell. Because of that, your throughput will reduce, first of all. And as you increase the number of multicast nodes, it drops precipitously from 5 to 10. It can drop from 80 kilobit per second to 40 kilobit per second. And, you know, you want to you know, do video, you want to have some reasonable bandwidth, not like 40 kilobit per second. Isn't that going to put some constraint on the constitution of multicast groups? If you, if you don't... You have to go through a particular part of the architecture to get it. That's you mean on the ad hoc network? On anything. I mean, if I, if I, if I have members of the multicast group dispersed in right. various parts of the network, right. because I'm going to connect through particular ground stations, yeah. how, how do you handle that? So It's not totally transparent, is it? No, it's not transparent, but we assume that the people, that the nodes, they have dual mode, that they have 3G as well as a 2 yeah, So how do they notify that they want to be members of the multicast group? Who do they notify? Well, but notifying the notification is some out-of-band mechanism. That is, you join a multicast group, like in, like, uh, in the cellular system, there's a protocol through which the mobiles can say that I want to join this one. And then you have to 11? You must have in every one of them some other way of telling, right? Yeah, so basically, just like in IP multicast, I could join a multicast group. Similarly here, there's a signaling protocol by which a mobile can say that I want to join this multicast group. And that is propagated to the 3G network. And there is what is called broadcast service node, which collects all the information and knows who are the receivers of the multicast group. So you have some explicit membership information by which you collect this information. And you need that also because you that don't is want... Fully, that is fully mesh or you assume that you have a star? No, it's, a, it's, it's not a mesh at all. In the 3G networks, so basically, it's a hierarchy. So you go like that and, you know, right. it's like a tree like that. Now, as I said that there's a problem in the uh, 3G network, Wi-Fi network is also is not a cakewalk either. I mean, what I'm showing here is the Wi-Fi network, as the number of relay nodes increases, the throughput can drop significantly. For example, it can start at like 1.5 megabit per second, and as you increase the number of relay nodes, you know, beyond four, it really drops the synthesis. So you want to have the multicast stream the ad hoc, but you don't want it to be too long. It has to be limited within the four hours. So here comes the, trying to answer the question, how do you choose a proxy node? So this is what we call the greedy heuristics for proxy discovery. So each node will discover the, you know, proxy. And then we, you know, mind the parts to keep, create a multicast stream. So this is how it works. So proxy discovery is initiated by a receiver broadcasting a request message within some range. So I'm looking for my proxy. I send out, I'm, this is my 3G rate. I'm receiving at 40 kilobit per second. I send it out to my neighbors. Now neighbor gets a packet, which is RT rate packet. And neighbor compares, is my rate better than his rate? Let's say the neighbor gets 100 kilobit per second. Oh, this is 100 and his is 40. So I'm better. So then it says, well, now that I'm, I could act as a proxy for the other guy, so it sends that information, this client, and its information to the base station, saying, that, hey, I could be a proxy, I'm receiving at 100 kb per second. And at the same time, it will forward the message to its neighbors. And the neighbor gets it, hey, it's 100 kb per second, what's my rate? Well, my rate is 200, so I can be a proxy for all this entire chain. So then it will, at a, then it will basically send the entire path to the base station with its rate. But then it goes to next level, next level gets 60 kilobit per second. Oh, you know, this rate is already higher. You know, I cannot be a proxy, so it drops the back number. So everybody, at some point, it propagates to a point which has the maximum 3G rate and passes the information to the base station with the entire path information. The so base station collects all this information, puts them together, what you call the uh, opportunity merge. So you merge, you combine the path of multiple receivers and intermediate relay nodes so that the number of packets along the multicast is minimized. So everybody, the proxy is sending the information, we collect them, put them, you can basically get multiple paths, 
and you put them together. How stable is this? Huh? How stable is this? How stable, stable is this? Yeah, what I'm asking is, uh, are you going to have fluctuations between the proxies? That's a good question. In fact, we did some uh, measurements with mobility, and uh, there are some issues. And in fact, you know, if the proxy nodes are static, they're not ad hoc, then it's, it's fairly, fairly stable. Pretty good, yeah. yeah, because if the proxy nodes themselves are mobile, then it becomes exactly the point that you're raising. So, and the forwarding is done like when a packet, each packet starts with a list of destinations, one, two, and three, that's the original packet, and the header splits. At this point, the header will have one because of only one, and the header will have two and three. So that's how we forward the multicast packet. Proxy gets the packet with the header, one, two, three, destination, and split the packet with the packet header. So here every packet has in the header the addresses of all the receivers. All the receivers going forward in the multicast. Isn't there a scalability issue here? No, I mean in the beginning you have, uh, uh, you know, all the destinations. If there will be, you know, there might be again, our goal here was not to, you know, uh, optimize the scalability, just to find out, in, not the signaling part, but to see that what kind of throughput we can get. Yeah, there could be some issues and... Uh, Good question. And uh, that is exactly what uh, the question was like, you know, what are you assuming about the relay nodes? What if, you know, they are in the same channel that would interfere? With? Exactly right. And we basically that is exactly why we have a pretty algorithm and the optimal relay algorithm. So what we are saying here is, here, this is the cross, this is the base station, and these are destinations 2 and 3. Now, if we use just the greedy heuristics, 2 will end up choosing 14 as its proxy, 3 will end up choosing 15 as its proxy, and the greedy algorithm will choose this path. That is, you go from here to 14, 12, 10, 2, and 15, 13, 11, 3. But unfortunately, exactly as you were saying, 14 and 15 might interfere. So you think that you have a good throughput, but not. Here, when 14 stands 20, 15 cannot. When 15 stands 20, 14 cannot. So the throughput is divided by 2. Again, next time 12 and 13 again interfere. Then it's divided by 2 again. So basically, you lose your throughput. But if you use the optimal algorithm, which takes into account this interference problem, then the optimal algorithm will choose 8 and 9 as proxy as opposed to 14 and 15 as proxy. So although this rate is lower than this rate, but this is avoid the interference, as a result you get a high throughput. And uh, so the DD algorithm can be suboptimal, and it finds relay paths these, and optimal relay paths are that. And that is exactly uh, what Professor Fremont was saying, and that's, we observe that, and that is a very the valid point. So, so GD relay, can give you about five, 40 kilobit per second. Optimal relay can go up to like 1 megabit per second. And the key takeaway from this chart is, in addition to discovering a good proxy, explicit consideration of the wireless channel interference between different relay paths is necessary for active optimizing throughput. If you don't take into account interference, you know, it's not going to work. And the near optimal algorithm is the following. What we did was, now let's say, well, can we come up with you know, something you know, which, is not, which is not a greedy heuristic, but we have more global information? Can we do it better? So the assumption is here we assume proximity-based interference model. That is, two nodes are within a certain proximity, within a transmission queue, some multiple of the transmission range, then they will interfere. And uh, also, two transmitters separated by minimum distance. The transmitters are not one on top of the other, but there's some minimum separation between them. And we only consider proxies with a constant number of hops away. That when we're looking at, we don't want to have a state space exploration problem. We want to have only like up to limited up to four halves. So the objective, so the objective was can we maximize the multicast throughput? So the achievable rate in the ad hoc network, that is for a node V in the ad hoc network, the rate is a minimum of F, which is the channel rate of the ad hoc network divided by K of G prime which is the minimum number of colors to color the graph G prime. G prime is the ad hoc relay for us. So basically all this is saying is, depending on how many paths interfere, you have to keep dividing the bandwidth available in the ad hoc network. So it's F divided by number of interference. And the PV, this is the 3G data rate of the proxy of V. So if I'm not V, so what is the bandwidth of my proxy? So if the rate that I receive will be minimum of the rate, the bandwidth uh, of my proxy receives, which is the 
P of G, and the, the bandwidth of the ad hoc network divided by number of interference bytes. So that's the ad hoc network bandwidth I can get. The node V, the multicast rate for node V will be the maximum of this ad hoc network, whatever bandwidth you can get, and the 3G bandwidth that the node itself can get. So what this is saying, this is, my multicast rate will be the minimum, maximum of two things. One is, I could get a multicast feed from the relay network, or I could get from the 3G network. I'll take the maximum of this two. So that's the maximum, that's my multicast rate. And then multicast rate for the entire group will be the minimum of all the nodes that they can see. So this, is, this problem is actually NP hard. I don't think it will, and, uh, and also the uh, interference range is, we assume that for the nodes to interfere, it will be uh, factor Q times the transmission rate, which is R of T. The number of interference paths is not such a neatly defined notion. I mean, the, the interference is all over the place. So you cannot say these are interfering and these are not interfering paths. It depends on the powers of the interfering signals, on the zero you have. So how, how are you defining the notion that two paths are not interfering or interfering? Yeah, that's here, in a practical environment, what you are saying is absolutely right. So what here, we made a simplifying assumption. The simplifying assumption, as I said, the assumption that we made is if two nodes, we, if the transmission range is R of T, and if the two nodes are within a factor of the uh, transmission range, we assume that they interfere. So that's much more simplified notion of, compared to the real world, where you have the power, you have many other factors. But we took a simplified notion and tried to see that, you know, what is it that we can do. So the way we solve this problem is we do divide and conquer. It's a two-level coloring problem. Uh, in the first level, what we do is we divide the base three G basis and cover into a grid of cell size two H plus Q plus epsilon times R T. So what we do is we take the whole area, divide into a grid of squares, and each square, the size of a square, is two H plus Q plus epsilon times the transmission rate. H is the maximum number of hops. If we say, well, we are not going to go beyond four hops, then H is four. And Q, as I said, is the uh, Q times RT is the interference range. So we define the uh, grid size by construction. So this is the size of each of the cells. And once we do this cell size, then we color the grid. So remember, the grid becomes multiple squares. So now we color the grids in such a way that no two adjacent grids have the same color. So as a result, I'm saying that these adjacent grids, they're not interfering. So that's the first step, first level. And the second level coloring is once I make sure that adjacent cells don't uh, interfere, now within a cell I want to avoid interference between the nodes in the cell. So for each grid cell C, we find the best multicast forest, we see prime for multicast C versus C. And once we find the best multicast forest, we, uh, each node gets a color. So within a cell, I color each of these nodes in such a way that they don't interfere and I give the color what is called X of V. So what we do is, intuitively, we divide the whole region into smaller cells. We solve it for, we find the best multicast forest for this each cell. For each cell we do that and put them together, I get the inverticus you know, for the whole region. So then we merge the solution of individual cells. Combine all VCs, our node V is finally colored with the tuple. YV is the color of the cell that the V is, and HV is the color the V this is within the cell. So it's a two-level coloring problem. And in fact, you know, what we can show, what we can prove, is the throughput in the multicast tree that we obtained by this near optimal algorithm is at least one-fourth of that obtained using the optimal algorithm. If we use the optimal, what the best we can get, our throughput will be at least one-fourth, if not better. And the reason the one-fourth comes in is the two-level coloring is a valid coloring, and two-level coloring uses at most four times the more colors than optimal. So this is the grid that I was talking about. You see, these are the cells we talked about, and with four colors, one, two, three, and four, I can show that no two adjacent cells will have the same color, so they're not going to interfere. And then, what we need to prove is, let's say we take a node V1 in cell C1, I take a node V2 in cell C3, and both C1 and C3, they have the same color four. If I can show that if I choose a node in C1 and a node V2 in cell uh, C3, and these two, the paths corresponding to V1 and corresponding to V2 are not going to interfere. So what I do is, for node V1, so I, idea is I take two nodes. They have the same you know, cell level color. Now I'm saying that the path for this node will be going to the proxy. Path for this node will go to another proxy. And then I'll show that these two proxies don't interfere. So the path don't interfere. 
So the way I do that is for V1, the proxy is uh, P of V1, and uh, and as I limit the distance of V1 and P of V1 to H times RT, so the distance is less than H times RT. Same thing is true with V2. With V2, again the same thing. The distance between V2 and P of V2 will be limited by H times RT. Now, what is the distance between the proxy of V1 and proxy of V2? The difference between the two is basically, this is the total, you know, the height, remember, is 2H plus Q times epsilon. From that, I subtract you know, 2 times HRT, and this is still greater than Q of RT. And Q of RT is the interference range. So these two points, P of V1 and P of V2, will not interfere. But, question? Question? No, our point is basically we want to make sure that they don't interfere. So it's done by construction. We, so the point here is we can come up with an algorithm that will give you, you know, within one-fourth of the maximum of the one support. Then we did some performance evaluation and uh, what's fine I have? Five minutes? Okay. So uh will uh uh this action uh uh exactly how often is this algorithm run? The uh, near optimal? Yes. No. So near optimal no. we did no. that no. Uh, not as uh, near optimal uh, and in the standard uh mark of mark as log Uh I mean uh, it will depend on the mobility. It will depend on the mobility yes. of, the, uh, of the group. But in our case, we did not run experiments to see how frequent you run. We just tried to come up with an algorithm to see the benefits. But then the next level question would be like, well, you have this algorithm, but how often do you have to run it? We have also some cases of mobility, but, uh, you know, that's a dynamic issue which we have not looked at. At performance evaluation, we did uh, NS2, we used the uh, uh, two-ray ground reflection model, load mobility, we used the random waypoint model using UDP traffic, uh, DO bandwidth 2.4 megabit per second, randomly placed 30 nodes in 600 uh, square meter uh, cell error uh, network, and five multiple receivers in a cell. And in mobile scenario, we assumed uh, 65 mobiles per cell, a multiple group of uh, 5 to 40, maximum speed of 50 meters per second. And then we discharged uh, from the load density when we varied the number of nodes in the cell from 15 to 125. And so when you compare the uh, throughput, the throughput in the no relay case is about 100 kilobit per second max, while the greedy and near optimal will reach a significantly higher throughput. And uh, even in the mean, minimum and average, you see that you get significantly higher throughput in greedy as well as the optimal compared to no relay case. And the average gains are significantly high, up to 840, that's about uh, eight times. And then we looked at the you know, average downlink rate for the greedy is uh, much higher than the optimal. Remember, in greedy, we choose the one with the maximum bandwidth. As a result, we had higher throughput. A uh, higher uh, uh, average downlink rate. A good port is higher in the near optimal because it avoids the interference. So we basically saw that together the near optimal outperformed the greedy by about you know, six percent in some cases. I want to show some results for how the results, what happens to the downward rate, good put, two put, and two put gain as we change the multiple group size. And again, we find that. Uh, as we increase the number of uh, uh, members of the group, the downlink rate does reduces. The two nodes here, the, this is what happens without the relay, this is what happens with the ad hoc relay. So we are already seeing significant gain by using this ad hoc uh, scheme. But nonetheless, in both cases, as we increase the number of receivers, the throughput reduces. The downlink rate re reduces. Good put increases, throughput reduces, and gain increases. So we saw some results with the multiple group. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on to node density. Again, we did some experiment with as we increase the number of mobile nodes, what happens? In fact, if you increase the number of mobile nodes, the 3G downlink rate increases. Why is that? Because as you increase the number of mobile nodes, then the topology becomes much richer. So the probability you'll find a node with a higher 3G bandwidth is higher. As a result, you, know, you see that you know, thing going up. And we did good port, throughput, and throughput gain, which are quite uh, optimistic. Then we looked at what happens with mobility if the links move. Uh, so obviously if you move, then one of the issues that brought us a lot of overhead because you have to signal a lot of things going back. So overhead goes up significantly, but the throughput gain sort of remains the same. It's sort of uh, flat. And uh, so 
this is the result of mobility. Then with what happens, the question dropped out, if instead of one multiple, there are multiple multiples, with what are the benefits you get? And they looked at that case as well, and the result is at the, this is a case of uh, no relay, and if you use relay, then, even then it goes up very high. The throughput gains are, are significantly high. And the other extensions were also, people asked questions about an ad hoc network, if it's a, one, it's a multi-rate ad hoc network, as opposed to single rate, what kind of things you see, and we have a polynomial that I've worked for the multi case as well. So there's a lot of related work in this area. The summary of the ICAM is, uh, the ICAM multicast improves 3G multicast throughput using ad hoc relays. Uh, 3G limited, uh, throughput is limited by the worst channel rate. So by finding proxies for receivers with poor channel quality and relaying multicast packets to Wi-Fi ad hoc network, we can improve the throughput of multicast sessions. We talked about two novel algorithms, VD heuristics and near optimal centers algorithm. And through uh, extensive simulations, we showed that we can gain performance benefits up, up to 840%. And near optimal algorithm outperforms greedy uh, uh, by 66% to 92% in static conditions. But when it's a mobile situation, the greedy heuristic performs very well. And it will still get up to four times or 400% improvement. So here's the conclusion. So what I talked about today is I talked about a hybrid 3G Wi-Fi network. And that is operational in the lab, home uh, lab, uh, in our lab. Uh, but here in the 3G part, we still don't have the VSR uh, using uh, Wi-Fi access point to emulate the 3G network. And the 3G base station router is being shipped to us, and we believe that we'll get it operational in the lab by January or February of 2005. And the goal is to put up this field trial in Rutgers by mid-2005, that is the May June time frame. We should have the first touch of the field trial network set up in Rutgers. So if, uh, anybody who happens to be in that area, you're welcome to try it out and hopefully we'll get some good feedback. So the building, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work and in addition to the building, we came up with some new research ideas. We talked about, we basically realized we need a fast handoff in CGPSR architecture to do state migration. We talked about virtual mobility in outdoor Wi-Fi networks and also we talked about multicast in hybrid 3G Wi-Fi networks. And I did not, I just touched upon extending Wi-Fi with ad hoc networks, did not talk about this. So this is the you know, summary of my presentation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Yeah. So, um, do you run multicast first or in the ad hoc part? Because for what I see in the example you have given, you give there, when the packet gets into the ad hoc mm -hmm. network part, yeah. then you are trying to find two separate paths. Mm -hmm. to the members, okay. then that's kind of unicast in the ad hoc part. Yeah, it's, uh, that's correct. So mm -hmm. you can do it in two ways. Although you're unicasting to these points, but if you merge multiple paths, still the number of replication that you have to do will be less compared to if you purely unicast. Right? Because you're merging multiple paths into the relay points. Multiple. Uh, so you're doing unicast. I agree with you, but again, you're unicasting less than what you do without doing multicast tree in the ad hoc network. Because you're say for each node you have a proxy, this node you have a proxy, this node you have a proxy, but you're merging the paths as you go up. But then you're trying to avoid interference, so then you get a two more separated path. That is correct. So there I are. I don't see the merging happening. No, merging is happening. On really? one proxy. On the one proxy is emerging. Another proxy is emerging. Yeah. So from e each intermediate point, you might send it to two proxies. And this proxy, just like a tree, like you send it out and then the forward. But we also looked into, instead of using unicast, if we can use the broadcast mode or it will be So that is also being looked into. Yeah. Although the, I talked today mostly on the unicast mode. Uh, do you have any comparison between the pure network supporting voice and the pure the 3G network, let's say 2.11b, the 11 megabits per second, total bandwidth, and the TVDO in terms of the number of users in the tension and the and the 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 the
number of circuit users in a 3G network against number of wipe users in a Wi-Fi. Or you can compare, you can say, well, I don't want circuit, I want packet in e-video and packet in 8 to Yeah, that's a packet. That would be more you want packet in both cases. Well, uh, what happens is in a packet, you know, I, we did experiments, I believe, you know, I don't know, I mean, recorded here. So I have to be a little bit careful. We did some experiments on, uh, on e-video, uh, you know, why, how many packets you could, how many connections you could support. So the kind of number of connections that you could support on per cell is on the order of, you know, it's about, uh, we get about 30, 35 to 40 earners. So it's about 30, 40 users, you know, per cell can be supported. But so far in the Wi-Fi network, the number of uh, wipe users you can support is limited because of interference and because of RTS, CTS, and people are looking into how you can avoid change as MAC so that you could increase the number of, although it has a higher bandwidth overall, you think you can support more wipe users, but no. One more because we have to stop uh, as another minute or thing. There will be a round table at 2, okay, so maybe you can continue the questions there, and it will be at the center, right? So I would like to welcome you to come there, and I'd like to thank the speaker again.